That which you are about to see and that which you are about to hear, it's not a figment of my imagination, neither was it a dream. But it was a vision from God that happened in the very early days of my ministry, which has probably motivated my ministry and my lifestyle since that night, 30 years ago. I preached this sermon for the first time in 1957 up in the state of Maine. On that night, over a hundred people came down the aisle and found Jesus Christ as their Savior. Since that time, I have seen hundreds find the Lord when this sermon was preached. Blanche Appleby, former missionary who has now gone to be with the Lord, wrote a foreword to a little book which contains this message. And she used a scripture which said, Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And in this foreword, Mrs. Appleby said, the response to the altar call the night that Pastor Vibbert preached this message in the camp meeting in Durant, Florida was so heartwarming that there must have been joy in heaven over the sinners that came repenting that night to find Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. And he said, she said it was gratifying to know how that he was sustained by the hours of this agonizing experience and kept by the power of God. Dr. Meyer Perlman wrote one time and he said the destiny of the wicked is eternal separation from God and the eternal suffering of his wrath, known as the second death. And because of its terrible nature, it is a subject from, when, from whence one naturally shrinks, yet it must be faced as a fact. Hell is a place of extreme suffering according to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. It was Dr. Thomas Griffith who wrote and told his students in a paper, motivation makes the man. So what was the motive of Jesus in giving this vision to me. Why me? It had to be because of Calvary's love and that he is not willing that any should perish but that all would come to repentance for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
and for these many years the vision of this hellbound train that you are about to hear and see has burned into my soul the awful truth that men and women are going to hell every second of every moment every moment of every hour and every hour of every day and it has challenged me and inspired me to preach as nothing else ever in my life I'd like to read a scripture from Job chapter 18 in the words of a text verse 5 yea the light of the wicked shall be put out and the spark of his fire shall not shine the light shall be dark in his tabernacle and his candle shall be put out within him and the strength of his steps shall be straightened and his own counsel shall cast him down my study was built under a stairway just a tiny room where I could be alone with God in the very beginning of our ministry and it was at, in this tiny room on this particular night so many years ago that the vision of the hellbound train occurred I was studying and reading my Bible possibly sometime around midnight and I was suddenly aware of a presence that came in the room that had not been there before and then a voice spoke to me and there was a vibrant power such vibrant vibrant power in the voice that it completely captured my attention and the voice said to me you you don't believe what you're reading in that book do you why don't you throw it aside and his cold perspiration covered my body and trembling I turned to see who was speaking and that as I turned I was able to vaguely see the form not able to distinguish but able to see a form from whence the voice was coming and then it seemed that this form was gone and in its place there began to form a great large black locomotive coming as it were out of space and rushing headlong toward me I could hear the the sound of the great steam locomotive I could hear the sound of the whistle I could see the fire belching from the great stack and from around the engine it seemed to be on fire all over and then suddenly the whistle rent the night and it was such a fearful sound because it was not the sound that I had been used to hearing when I was a boy listening to the old steam engines pass near our home but it seemed to be the the sound of someone screaming and something seemed to say to me this is a lost soul on the hellbound train as it plunges into hell lost eternally forever without God horror 
are so filled my heart that I drew back with a shudder. And then the vibrant voice spoke to me again and said, Come, come, I want you to see what is on the inside of the train. And because of the fire and because of the smoke and the awful steam, I drew back. I seemed to draw back and the voice spoke and said, Come, there's no harm to be done to you. I want to show you what's on the inside of the train. And so with these words, as I seem to be taken up into the front of the front coach of that great black locomotive, and the heat and the flames seemed to be jumping at me from all around, and he opened the door, and we stepped on the inside in such a scene that I have never or ever will see was before me. And the sound of the awful screams and the crying and the groaning and the agony that was etched in every face. My heart seemed to stand still. And I, as I looked at this awful, awful scene and realized that these people were on train, which was the hell-bound train that God used possibly to, to show me the awfulness of a place called hell. It seemed that each one was pleading with me to help them escape from this awful place. And I wondered then and there, had I been sincere enough in my pleading for lost men and women? Had I given all that I possessed, surrendered to him, that I might win more souls for the kingdom of our Lord? Had my efforts been for God's glory, or, why, or was I building partly to glorify man? I had the urge to leap to the side of each of those wretched people and try to tear, take away the chains that, that seem to bind them. But the voice of my guide with laughter reminded me, it's too late, too late now, forever and forever. There was no release. Their day of salvation had come and was gone. All their tears, all their praying, all their crying, all their begging was to no avail as they rode the awful hellbound train. I want you to meet some of the passengers, said my guide. I'm quite sure that you are, will be acquainted with them because you read of them in this book. And I noticed that he always referred to my Bible as a book, and he never would call it a Bible. And then we were standing by the man in the first seat, and he looked up at me and cried through puffed lips, tell him, tell him, I am not my brother's keeper. Would you tell him? And then I knew that this man must be Cain. And I remembered the story in the book of Genesis chapter 4, were the earth's first children, Cain and Abel, born of Adam and Eve, how that they had brought their sacrifices to God. And the Bible story says that Abel offered a lamb, the blood of the sacrificial lamb unto God, which of course is a type of that offering that God would one day make in the person of his son, the eternal sacrifice to pay for the sins of mankind, and how that God was pleased with the offering of Abel. But when Cain came, he offered the fruit of the ground or the works of men's hands, and God rejected this offering of Cain. And Cain hated his brother Abel and rose up 
in anger and wrath and slew him. In my spirit I cried, O oh God, help me, help me to bring you an offering always. Let my offering unto you be that which will be well-pleasing in thy sight. And never let me be driven by the spirit of Cain that would drive me out of the presence of God forever and help me to say words to influence men and women that they too will never be driven by a Cain spirit that would rob them of the sweet and the blessed touch of God. And then my guide said, if this man, one of God's first, creatures could not serve him or obey him do you think then that you or anyone else can or is it worthwhile for all men to make such an effort and before I could reply he said come there are many more on this train that I want to show you and with the cries of men and women all around me seemed to tear at my very heart strings as I looked down into their tormented faces I saw there the hopelessness in their eyes the fear that drove them into a frenzy stop here said the voice to me and take a look at this man do you know him and I turned to look down at the great bulk of a man as he set a stuffing something in to his mouth and it seemed that even though his mouth was filled and was trying to uh, contain himself that he kept cramming whatever was in the bowl into his mouth he was a very ruddy complexion and had an unnatural amount of hair and I knew at once that this man was Esau and I recall the story how that Esau the brother of Jacob the sons of Isaac how that Esau was a great hunter and he had been out hunting in the field and coming in from the hunt Jacob was preparing food and Esau was hungry for food and he said give me some of the portion of your food and of course Esau being the eldest was the one in line to receive the inheritance and Jacob knew that and Jacob said if you will give me your inheritance then I'll give you the pottage. And in a, in a moment of weakness, driven by fleshly desire and human craving, Esau said, you can have my birthright. I'll take the food. Later in the New Testament, the Bible records the story of how that Esau came and re tried to repent before God bitter with tears but found no place for repentance and as I looked at that pitiful sight as he continued to cram food into his face the agony and the regret that was registered on his countenance and I began to wonder how many just as guilty as Esau had sold that which was precious for the lust of the flesh, for one night of hidden sin, one act of fleshly indulgence that might cause a man to lose his soul. And God Almighty in that moment seemed to impress forcibly upon me to warn the people and to learn myself that of the selling of the souls at the cost of self-gratification and human craving 
and fleshly lust. Ladies and gentlemen, this precious birthright that God has given to every man, and that is the right to inherit heaven and all that heaven contains and all the glory that is in heaven by accepting Jesus Christ as their son. Let me impress it upon you. What will it profit a man if he gain all that the flesh has to offer and loses Christ in the end? You see, Esau could have had heaven's best and even earth's best, but he sold out. Listen to me. God offers you and I the best. Let's not forfeit it for that which only lasts for a fleeting moment and is gone forever and forever. Making my way on down through the coaches, ever aware of the pleading, suffering faces that were around me, the despair that was written and etched there as they lifted their hands, tearing at my clothing, trying to reach me with pleading voices. I was suddenly brought to the halt by the cry of a man seated just ahead. And he was saying these words, my judgment, my judgment is more than I can bear. Yes, I was a leader in the camp of Israel. And here are those who were with me, Dathan, Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and here is a son of Pelah. We were close to Moses, but we didn't think because of the faction we started in the camp that our judgment would be so terrible and so great. And then by his confession, I knew who it was, it was Korah, Korah and his followers. And then I remembered in the book of Numbers, chapter 16, I believe, how that Korah and 250 of the chief men, the Bible called them men of renown, had gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron, saying, why do you lift yourselves up above all the congregation, seeing that all men are holy? And Moses, of course, who was God's chosen leader, recognized the jealous spirit that was there and the spirit of rebellion that was burning in the heart of Korah and the 250 chief men. Moses, full of love, pled with them to present themselves before God in repentance, but they would not. And the earth opened. The Bible tells the story of how the earth opened and actually swallowed them up, Korah and his followers. And I thought, my God, how many entire families have had to suffer because of the rebellion of one person against God's chosen leader. The tragedy is this. Korah and the others had a place of, re of respect and a place of esteem. And no, no doubt among the people, they were re well received. But because their, they permitted their eyes to be blinded by the devil and to be overcome with enemy, this then was the result of their transgression. There is a place, let me say, there is a place in the kingdom of God for everyone, a place that God will give you, a place that he will give me. He knows where you and I can excel. It may not be as prominent as the place that someone else may hold, but God knows the place. Let God promote you. Let him give you the place in which you will do the best. This seemed to come to me 
as I saw this wretched man and his followers as they rode the hell-bound train, realizing that they were lost forever, there was no reprieve. My heart bled for them, and I longed to reach out in some way and help them. But the laughter of my guide as he said, come, there are many more, attracted my attention, and I moved on down the aisle. And then my eyes were glued to a man that had a piece of metal in his hand. It seemed like a, a piece of gold, and it seemed so strange that he was trying to hurl it from him, that he would, he would throw his hands and try to get rid of it and try to shake it off, but it kept sticking to his hands. And the terrible truth then dawned upon me that this must be Aiken. This was the man who, along with Joshua, had won a great victory at Jericho. And then God had sent them against Ai, and there at Ai, the Lord had instructed Joshua to tell the people that all the gold, that all the precious stone, that all the tapestries belonged unto God, and no one was to touch it. And how that Achan took part of the spoil, the gold bar and the tapestries and the precious ornaments and hid them in his tent and how that God revealed to Joshua of what he had done, and they went into battle at Ai and lost the battle because of the transgression of a man who was greedy. As I looked at this poor man, my heart was broken for him, yes, but also for all the Achan since then. That Achan was not the only Achan who ever lived. There are Achans who are living today. There are Achans who are possibly even in this audience now. They're guilty of the same thing that Achan did. What did Achan do, Brother Vibbert? He did is exactly what the Scripture says that we should not do. Did you know that it's possible that God's church can be void of the blessing of the Lord because of the Achans in the crowd, or taking that which belongs to God. That's what I'm trying to say. God told Joshua, you tell the people that all the spoil belongs to the Lord, and no one is to touch it. And I think of all the Achans since then who have taken that which belongs to God, and they thought they were getting away with it. Achan didn't get away with it. Be sure that your sin will find you out. He was crying to me, now here, take the gold. Take it from me. As I moved away, I seemed to hear him say, take it, I don't need it where I'm going. I wondered how many times or how many there will be in torment who would gladly say, all of the ill-gotten riches that I have, I give to you if you will only set me free from my judgment. What will it profit a man, roared the scriptures into my ears and burning into my heart. What will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and everything that's in it and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If we could pull back the lid of torment tonight, but if you let me use such a term, you would hear the cries of those who would say, all the riches that I have I'll give for one, one drop of water, just one drop of water, but it's too late. The Scriptures records the story of another man that sat in the seat just ahead as he sat there head and shoulders above everyone else. Great, large, handsome man. I remembered many of the feats of this man because I recognized this man as the first king of Israel. 
his name was Saul. I remembered how the Bible said that Samuel poured the oil upon his head and how that he became a prophet of God actually and prophesied as the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Then why was he here? Why was Saul here on the hellbound train? I looked at this great handsome man and I just couldn't seem to understand why until the story seemed to burn into my heart. Saul had permitted his exalted position to bring him to a place of pride. For the Bible says that pride entered into his heart, and before any man falls, pride has something to do with it. Saul became filled with pride, and then he became jealous of David, and then he became hungry for more power and possessions. And when they went down to battle against King Agag, how that Samuel had instructed him by the Spirit of the Lord that they were to slay everything, all the men, women, children, all the cattle, all the, everything. But when Saul went down to battle against Agag, because of what King Agag offered Saul, he spared him and the best of the flock. And when he came back to give a report to Samuel, Samuel said, did you do what the Lord had said? He said, everything the Lord said. And about that time was heard the lowing of the cattle. And the story came out how that Saul, because of his selfish heart and selfish nature, the jealous spirit that had crept in and pride had swallowed up his life. How that he went from bad to worse and finally the final picture we see of King Saul going down and defeat this once great man who was invincible, a mighty warrior of God, falling on his own sword. The wretched life ending in suicide. How many people, I wonder, have been overcome by the same tragic mistake? How many precious ones have fallen by the wayside and become driftwood on the sea of life because of pride in their heart? Oh, God, I prayed in that moment, help me to fulfill the word that says, he that humbleth himself will be exalted if i am to be exalted if you are to be exalted let's wait for god to do it and when god does it he will do a good job by this time a great burden had so gripped my heart that i felt that it would break as the cries of anguish came from all around me faces haunted faces staring at me haunts me even now even as i speak to you in this moment i can see the agony in those faces as they looked at me and then my attention was captured by a woman seated there just ahead and she seemed to be uh, sitting in a strange way and as i beheld her I noticed her her head was turned in a in a grotesque manner and she kept trying to to get it back straight but it wouldn't go and i knew in a moment that this was mrs lott and i remembered the story how that the angels of god uh, because of the consideration of abraham how that god sent angels to the city of sodom and actually force Lot, Abraham's nephew, and his wife, and their daughters to leave and hasten from the city of Sodom that was about to feel the destructive hand of a wrathful God. And how that the Lord had said, tell them not to look back. And the final word of the angels to Lot and Mrs. Lot and the girls were, leave the city and do not look back. But you know the story that how leaving Sodom, Mrs. Lot could not just restrain herself. She could not help but turn and take one last glance at that life that she had loved so well down there in the wicked city of Sodom. But in that instant, in that moment, the Bible says that she turned to a pillar of salt. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this word of God said, he that putteth his hand to the plow and looketh back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Let me urge you uh, today that if you have ever started for the kingdom, keep your eyes upon Jesus. Keep your eyes upon the prize for the home in the sky. There's nothing back there to go back to. Let's keep on going in the right direction. And then my guide said, take a look at this person. And seated there, just beyond Saul was a very impressive looking man. He was dressed in such beautiful, rich apparel with many rings upon his fingers. About his neck was a golden chain which bore the royal imprint of a kingdom. On his head was a crown. In his hand was a golden cup, and that was the thing that attracted me. In his hand was a golden cup that was stained from the wine that he had been drinking. But I looked at his face, and I saw the terrible fear that was in his eyes, and then I knew who it was. This was Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar how that he had ordered his servants to go to the temple and bring the holy vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Jews and bring them to this wild orgy and this night of revelry and how that they had desecrated the holy vessels of God that was only to be touched by the holy man and the priest. And suddenly the room had become quiet and there on the wall, in the eyes of thousands of people, was a hand that was writing, only a hand. And as Belshazzar's knee smote together, he, found, he brought his wise men, his magicians, to try to read the handwriting, but none could read. Word was sent for Daniel, and Daniel came. And you remember how that Daniel said, yes, I can read what the words say. And he interpreted the words to Belshazzar. And with eyes filled with tear, tears and fear and knees trembling, he heard the sentence of Almighty God. Thou hast been weighed in the balance and have been found wanting. Why? Because he desecrated that which is holy. Friends, you cannot take the things which are holy. You cannot desecrate this word. You cannot desecrate God's church. You cannot desecrate that mother's prayers. You cannot step over these things which are precious. God will call you into account and you will stand that day in the day of judgment and say and give God the reason why. Come, said my guide. There are others for you to see. I followed him as my burden became greater and greater. And then two of the most awful looking creatures I've ever seen sat just ahead. A woman seated with a man and she seemed to be so angry and so wrathful toward him that she was actually beating him with her fist and such blasphemous words I have never heard and her face was painted in such an unusual and in such a queer manner. Her eyes were a deep purple. I see her even now. And then I knew who it was. This was Ahab and Jezebel. This was the tormentors of the people of God. This was the pagan queen who had torn down the worship of the true God in the land. This woman is the one of whom John spoke of in the book of Revelation when he said, and that wicked woman, Jezebel, 
her husband Ahab, the Bible records, was the most hated king that Israel ever had. But even his hate was more intense for the prophets of God and for the people of God. And the reason was is because they always told him the truth. And you know the story how that in the life of Jehu when he came to the city to overrun it, the host of God to overrun a pagan queen in her kingdom, how that Jehu had ordered her throw it down from the balcony into the streets. And when she was cast down to the stones, that the dogs consumed her body, fulfilling a prophecy that had been made by the prophets. And even the dogs, after consuming her body, would not eat the palms of her hands or the soles of her feet. Why? Because these hands, her hands, her filthy hands had been lifted in defiance against God. It had been lifted against the men that were God's men, against the things that were holy. Her feet had trod in evil places until even the dogs would not eat her hands or her feet. Hell, my friends, is going to be a place of the company of such people. Hell is going to be a place where no good thing will ever happen. Can you imagine that? To be in a place where no good thing will ever happen. Only wailing, agony, gnashing of teeth, cursing, blasphemy, forever and forever. This was my thought as I rode on the hell-bound train with those who were bound for the kingdom of eternal darkness forever and forever. Sitting alone in the corner of the next coach was a man with his head in his hands and coming from his bowed form was the sound of broken, broken weeping and moaning and as we approached his side he started up and with fear filled eyes and cringing back as he first saw the form and then he saw me he began to reach out toward me and the pitiful words came and said have you came for me have you come to set me free and then I saw a piece of broken rope that was knotted about his neck. And I realized who it was. In his left hand was a skin pouch, and I could hear the jingling of coins as he trembled. This was Judas. I beheld him. I saw a very handsome man with dark, deep-set eyes and heavy brow. He was tall, yet was somewhat stooped, as though the burden of the whole world was upon him. Then I thought what a burden of guilt was upon this wretched creature. For it was he, Judas, who had betrayed the Son of God, the Lamb of God, into the hands of wicked men. Here was a man who had been closely associated with the Lord Jesus in his ministry. In fact, he was one of the twelve. He had heard him preach many times. He had seen him and he had heard that blessed voice that had spoke peace to the troubled minds and the troubled hearts of those who came to him. He had beheld him as he had watched Jesus as he touched the crippled man and watched the lame leap for joy, discovering newfound legs and limbs restored. He watched him as he reached down in the dust of the road and took dust and mixed it with spittle and made clay and anointed a man's eyes and saw eyes come open that had never seen a sunrise or a sunset.
This Judas had been there when he had watched him heal the sick, raise the dead. He had heard him preach that great sermon when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. There had been many times when he had seen the hand of Jesus reach forth in power and in mercy to help those who were in need. Yet this, Ju this Judas had sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver or something over $17. And as I looked at this poor, wretched, wretched creature, as he, with tears streaming down his face, pled with me to help him, a voice seemed to say within my own heart, how many times since Judas have there have been those who have sold the Lord for a lot less? Oh, the awful truth to be shut out of the presence of the Lord, never to hear his blessed voice again, shut out of his presence, out of eternal light, locked into eternal darkness. My precious friend, those of you hear me preach this message, let me say to you, keep yourselves in the love of God. Sell not this which is precious. Let not the wrong spirit enter into your heart, into your soul. Your life is precious in the eyes of God. It's worth all the kingdoms of this world. This man, said my guide, as he pointed to a man, spends all of his time upon his knees. And I looked at the bowed head of a man as he knelt. And I could hear him. And he was saying, oh God, send Brother Paul to release me from this awful place. Give me one more chance. Never again will I forsake you to love or to follow this present evil world. And then the scripture came to me immediately, this man was Demas. This man was a co-worker of the Apostle Paul, and Paul wrote the account when he said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. What was the attraction? What is the attraction? What would cause a man, or what would cause you or me, having had the touch of heaven upon their life, and the joy of the Lord in their soul, what would the attraction have to be to cause me to learn to turn away from the loveliness of Christ? What is so attractive and so alluring that it's more wonderful than the know Jesus Christ and the power of God in your life. Yet I know that there are thousands of people and possibly even more who have once tasted of the good things of God, have turned away from him, and in doing so, the Bible says they have put the Son of God, crucified the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. As tears streamed down from my eyes, Paul's words to Timothy came to me, and I want to read them from you from God's Word. Listen to what it says. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more 
them, lovers of God. I wonder how many souls in hell ever live, ever thinking, ever praying, ever hoping that someone will come, someone someday to remove the everlasting chains. Oh, my precious friend, don't let Satan blind you with this passing world as it did Demas, for it will soon pass away. Pass in your hopes on the Lord Jesus Christ. In the next seat was a couple, and this was the greatest shock, the greatest shock that I had during the whole vision. Because as I looked at this man and woman, I could tell by their looks and by their apparel, and there was something about them that I recognized that this was Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira. These were church people. These were people that were in the upper room when the Holy Ghost fell. And here they were on the hellbound train. But the story is so vivid in God's Word how that Ananias came to church and joining with the rest of the disciples and the apostles when they brought all that they possessed and laid it down at the apostles' feet. And Ananias and Sapphira were two of those who withheld. And God prompted Peter through the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? You see, Ananias and Sapphira had sold a possession, but instead of doing as all the others and bringing the proceeds, they had held back and kept it for themselves. I want to say, friend, there are many of people who are in the kingdom of God let selfishness enter into their heart and in into their life. Just as Ananias and Sapphira, even though workers in the church, consecrated and dedicated, let me say to you, you cannot keep too close to God. Keep your dedication on the altar before him. And I thought, while the door of grace stands open in a jar, it's not too late. You don't have to be an Ananias and Sapphira. The door of grace is open, and you can come and come back to God and make wrongs right. They could have done it too, but they chose not to. As I moved on down the aisle, I could hear the weeping and groaning of Ananias and Sapphira, and the lonely cry comes to me even now as I hear them crying out, Oh God, have mercy, but it's too late. It's too late now, forever and forever. And then my guide spoke to me and said, I'm going to show you the next car full of people. And I might say to you that there are many more just like this one that you're about to see. With these words, I stepped into the awful, screaming mass of people. I guess the thing that struck me so forcibly about these people were the, the way that they were dressed because I recognized that many of them were dressed in the cloth of the clergy. And as I beheld the scene, I saw many hands reaching out toward them and I heard the people screaming, you're the cause that we're here. Why didn't you tell us? You never preached about hell. You never said we had to get right with God. You never talked about being converted. You're the cause. You're the cause. And then I prayed, oh my God, help me ever to warn men that there is a hell to gain, a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. Help me to ever tell men that they need to repent of their sins 
and turned to God. And then my guide laughingly said, there is car after car of people just like this who thought that because they were just good, sociable, tax-paying citizens that they were perfectly all right. But yet, here they are. And yet, these men who were supposed to tell them failed to do so. If you hear me today, if God has laid upon you his call to preach the word, make sure that you do what the apostles were instructed to do, preach the word, be instant, in season, and out of season. For the word of God, preached under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is the only way that men can find their way to heaven. It seemed that an eternity had gone by as I sat transfixed in my chair. Cold sweat was upon my forehead and I was trembling in my whole body. But suddenly I was aware that now the evil presence was gone and another voice was speaking to me. The sweetest voice I have ever heard, I think, was the voice of my precious mother, now with the Lord, whom she loved so very much. And I thought her voice meant more to me than any other voice. But oh, how sweet and precious was the sound of this voice. And I found myself no longer trembling. And the perspiration was gone from my face. And I found a joy flooding my heart that's inexplainable. And I began to praise his name, the name of Jesus. And the very joy bursting from the depth of my soul, I lifted my face toward heaven. And in the place of the horrible hell-bound train with the fire and smoke and the screams of the lost, there etched against the sky, silhouetted on the horizon was a picture of a cross. And as I beheld it there, the voice came again. And then I could see him, the lover of my soul the Father's only Son, the Redeemer of the world. He was speaking from the cross, and I felt myself falling down before, as men of long ago had done when they encountered him. And then he spoke, and he said to me, My son, permitted you to see what you have seen and I've let you hear what you have heard I have let you see and hear the lost and their cry remember how Satan showed you the empty coaches and you heard him say that he would fulfill them all and I nodded my head in assent, he, and then he continued and said, and I hear it now, he said, if you, if you, my son, if you will preach my word, and if you will preach the cross, and if you will preach the great love of God, and plead for the souls of men because of your message, many will not ride the hellbound train. But remember this, always remain humble. Never let yourself become exalted in your heart. Pray and tell men everywhere that God loves them. Tell them that no one need be lost, for my grace is abundant. Go now 
And I'll go with you even to the end of the age.